to give honor to God who is ahead of my life. He is my king and my savior, and I truly worship him. And then real, before we go into the word, I just want to acknowledge just a few people. My mom and dad came in, praise God. And my, you know, there's always that one person that makes you nervous. <laughs> Hey Amen. When I saw mom and dad surprisingly walk in, I was like, oh, my, my gut started turning. And I was like, I promise I know how to preach, but when I get in front of them, I really act like I don't. Amen. And then my auntie and my cousin, me and my auntie used to church together when we were kids. We put in a lot of hours. Amen. When I was young, when I was a little boy, she used to pick me up and take me to church. And we put in a lot of hours, man. I mean, we were churching from like 6 p.m. to 1, 2, 12 a.m. You know, it was one of them kind of churches. And so it's just, I thank her for the investment that she made in uh, taking me to church when I was a kid. Amen? Amen. Last night, we were able to rejoice in the Lord when we went down the sheep gate together. Amen? Did y'all enjoy going down the sheep gate? Yes. Amen. The sheep gate was the place, was the beginning of the process of reconciliation with God. Amen? God uses Nehemiah to go and rebuild ten gates. And these 10 gates were God's blueprint, was his master plan of how he was going to reconcile man to himself. It was such an amazing feat that when Ephesians comes around, when Paul begins to write about this ministry or this reconciliation that God would introduce, he said, my God, to, to, unto him who's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that I can ever ask or think of according to the power that's at work within you. Amen. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, man. He was excited. He's saying, man, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. He didn't know how to, how to contain himself when he thought that God, before time began, thought of a master plan of how to reconcile man back to himself. And through the tabernacle and through, and through the temple and God began to reveal himself through the sacrifices and through the feast. And then he revealed himself to us through the ten gates that Nehemiah rebuilds. And so the beginning of the process of reconciliation began at the sheep gate. When God said the beginning of it would, call, would, would be require the shedding of blood. And it would require a lamb and it would require a high priest and it would require a temple and it would require a sheep gate. And Christ came to be absolutely every single one of those elements that were required to rebuild the sheep gate. Amen. He came to heal the blind and crippled animals. Remember that were being offered to him in Malachi? The blind and crippled sheep that were being offered. He came to heal them through his grace. He said, pray that God would be gracious to you. Remember? This is why when John sends his disciples to go ask Jesus, are you the one? Jesus didn't tell him yes or no, and Jesus didn't remind him, hey, remember when I was in my mother's womb, and you were in your mother's womb, and she, my mother went and greeted your mother, and you leaped inside of your mother's womb? He didn't say that, and he didn't even say, hey, remember when you were baptizing people, and you saw me, and you were prophesying about me, and said that one was greater than you was coming, whose laces I'm not even worthy to tie, and you saw me, and you were actually the one who appointed me. You said, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. You were the one. How can you forget? Yeah, yeah. Amen. But just like every Christian, we all run into a situation that will cause you to sit there and wonder. Amen. And John was in the cave or rather in a dungeon there waiting for his death. And he sent his disciples to go ask Jesus, are you the one? And Jesus Christ's response was, look, I'm going to respond to him in messianic code. Right. Amen. Because the Messiah came to open the blind eyes of the lamb, over, heal the crippled animals that couldn't make it to the temple. And he said, look, just go back and tell John the blind see, the lame walk. I'm healing the sheep. I'm healing the animals. They're making it into the temple. It's because of me that they're making it into the presence of God again. We never hear John ask another question because he understood the revelation. He said, this is him. Amen. But then once you were done going through the sheep gate or when you received the blood of Jesus, when the atoning blood of the atoning uh, blood that would atone the presence of God would allow us to enter into his presence. It said that what it was connected to the tower of the hundred and now no one need, needed to be lost. Anyone who wanted to, anyone who would, anyone who was willing to, Christ can heal you. Amen. Christ would, would make you part of his, his hundredfold sheep. No one needed to be lost. Whosoever will. It was open for everyone, Jews and Gentiles alike. Remember? 
And then it was connected to the tower of Hananiel, which was the tower of what? Y'all were here last night. What was it? The tower of Hananiel. What was it, brother? The Tower of Grace. It was going to be through this element, this grace factor that would connect earth to heaven. Amen? That would draw us upward, that would influence us to get up. Because the first thing in Canaan, the Hebrew word Canaan, which means to stoop down. Remember, grace. Man, be gracious to us. Favor. The Hebrew word in, the, the word in Hebrew was Canaan, to stoop down like you would stoop down to a dog. Amen? And God stooped down through Jesus Christ. And then when he stooped down, then to Kairis, through the Greek word grace, which means the divine influence upon the heart and his reflection on the life through that influence. When he told the guy at Bethesda at the house of grace, get up, what happened to him? He got up. Amen. Because when grace influences you, there has to be an exterior effect. Praise God. And so it would be this grace factor that would now cause us to rise. And then that would connect earth to heaven. And that is why it was the tower of grace. They, at Babel, they messed up. Remember at Babel, they were trying to build a tower with their own hands. But when Christ came, he came to build the tower of Hananiel, the tower of Canaan, amen, the tower of grace. And then it says what? That after Christ had ascended into heaven and he went up like a tower, then the day of Pentecost, the same languages that God used to confuse them at Babel, it was the same languages he restored at Pentecost because he wanted everybody to make the announcement and the declaration, there's no longer any room for confusion. I don't want you to be confused. I want all of you to understand understand that the tower of grace has been built amen amen and so once you do that nehemiah chapter 3 let's go over to nehemiah chapter 3 there was so much more but those of you that are coming for the first night i just wanted to give you a little tidbit you know just to kind of catch you up a little bit even though it's going to be hard to catch you up but we know that we're going to go down the second gate together the, the fish gate. Nehemiah chapter 3. While you are there at Nehemiah chapter 3, it says, verse 3, the fish gate was rebuilt by the sons of Hasena. The sons of who? Hasena, the Hebrew word is pricks, thorny, thorns. These were the sons of thorns. Amen. And it was a pair of brothers. It was brethren who would re be responsible to rebuild the fish gate. And what were they? Brothers. They were brothers. Brothers rebuilt the fish gate. Amen? Amen? Well, before we go back to Matthew, actually, let's go to Matthew. We saw it yesterday. What gate are we rebuilding? Fish. The fish gate. Because after you have experienced the sheep gate, it is your responsibility now to go down to the fish gate and rebuild the fish gate. Let's go down to, to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. If we're going to hang out together, you know that we're going to go through the scriptures. Amen? Amen. Chapter 4 and verse 18. Now, I told you last, yesterday, last night, that Jesus came to validate every single one of these gates in, in, in Nehemiah. Why? Because this was, this was God's plan to reconcile God back to himself. I know in church we, we focus on a whole lot of other things, but the heart of the matter, the heart of the issue, the heart of God, from the beginning of Genesis all the way through the end is how can I reconcile man back to myself? Whenever you read the scripture outside of that perspective, that's when we begin to go wayward with the word. When you read the word, the perspective that we must have is the perspective that God intended from the beginning. Amen? And that was to reconcile man back to himself. That's all that matters. Amen? And so, so, so the fish gate is the second gate, and it says here, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two, who? Now, now in Nehemiah, who repaired the fish gate? The brothers. So Jesus goes to fulfill the fish gate. <laughs> Amen. He knew that he had to go find himself a pair. 
of brothers. Amen? And then it says here, he found himself two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake for they were, what was their occupation? Who better to rebuild the fish gate? Amen? Then two brothers that are already fishermen. <laughs> oh, amen. Praise God. And then it says here, come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, G James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father, Zebedee, um, preparing the nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father, and they followed him. Now let's go to Ezekiel because Ezekiel is going to give us a better understanding as to what's happening here. Ezekiel chapter 47. While you turn to Ezekiel, I just want to briefly tell you about the fish gate. The fish gate was a marketplace. What was it? A lot of times I'm going to ask you questions because I want this thing to resound in your mind. Amen. It was a marketplace. This was a place of transaction. Somebody say transaction. This was where the exchange of money for goods was taking place. So the professional fishermen would come to the fish gate, and there they would bring their, you know, whatever fish y'all like, you know, your flounder and your catfish. Well, I don't know catfish because they didn't have scales, but, you know, they wanted to keep with the law. So, you know, they brought their carp and all them little fish, you know, with scales on them, and they brought them, and you were having a barbecue with your buddies. You'd go down to the fish gate, and there you get yourself five pounds, amen, of fish, and then you go back and put it on the grill, praise God, and make you a sandwich. <laughs> Amen. Make you a sandwich. <laughs> Amen. And so this was a marketplace. Praise God. Let's go see what's happening down at the fish gate in Ezekiel 47. Ezekiel 47, verse 6. Ezekiel is one of the most complicated books in the Bible to study. You know, the revelation is deep and Daniel is deep. But Ezekiel is so complex, amen? What we're going to read is a prophecy of Ezekiel. Uh, let's go read it. It says, he asked me, son of man, do you see this? Then he led me back to the bank of the river. When I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river. He said to me, this water flows towards the eastern region and goes down into the Arabah, where it enters the sea. When it empties into the sea, the waters there become fresh. Swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. There will be large numbers of, what is it? Large numbers of fish because this water flows there and makes the salt water fresh. So where the river flows, everything will live. Fishermen will stand. Uh, who's going to stand? Fishermen will stand along the shore from Engedi to Engadlium. There will be places for spreading nets. The fish will be of many kinds, like the fish of the great sea, like the fish that Revelation says. They were of many kinds, of many tribes, of many languages. Praise God. What he is prophesying about was that there was going to be some healing waters one day, and that there would be fishermen standing right by the river, and with the gospel message, with the net of the kingdom, the they would be casting it in and they would be catching fish. These weren't fish. These were humanity. Amen. He was prophesying about a day when the gospel message would be preached by fishermen. And fishermen were going to be able to catch fish and for the Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, why does God liken us to fish? The Lord throughout the scripture uses typologies. Amen. He uses type shadows and, and symbolism. He uses fish to symbolize the kingdom of God or humanity because of this. When you read the word fish in the Hebrew, it's the word dog, D-A-G, and you pronounce it D-A-W-G, like what's up, dog? Amen? Just using some colloquialism so you can understand what's happening. Amen? D-A-G. And it means fish, prolific. Amen? Prolific. A plant, and I'm going to give you the definition of prolific, a, of a plant, animal, or person producing much fruit or foliage of many offspring. It is from the root word in Hebrew, which is daga, which, means, which is, means to move rapidly, to spawn, become numerous. Why was God liking in humanity and his kingdom to fish? 
Because when the fish were brought in, the goal of the kingdom was to reproduce rapidly and abundantly. How? Rapidly and abundantly. You lay when Peter begins to preach the word, amen? When Peter begins to preach on the day of Pentecost, the kingdom begins to spread like fish rapidly and abundantly. 3,000 got saved. 5,000 got saved. It became numerous quickly, amen? And so the kingdom of God is meant to reproduce like fish. So fish represent who? Humanity. Fish represent humanity. Amen? Praise God. Let's go. Let's dive a little bit deeper. Because Christ used three and a half years of his ministry to teach the disciples how they were going to grow the kingdom rapidly and abundantly. Amen? Rapidly and abundantly. I'm not talking about financially, but I'm talking about like numerously, like quickly. Amen? The kingdom message was supposed to spread quickly and win souls. Praise God. And he uses three and a half years of ministry to teach them how to do it. Now, you know that Christ taught through parables. You know that Christ taught through the things that he did, his, his disciples, the people he was disciplining, his students, were supposed to sit there and watch this thing. Amen? Watch it. Just like Joshua was watching Moses, like Elias was watching Elijah. Amen? The disciples were watching Jesus Christ and see what he did and heard what he said and his parables. And he would explain the parables to them to teach them because they were students. Yeah. Praise God. Let's go see what Christ does. Go over there to Luke chapter 9. Say, I'm going to learn how to grow the kingdom today. The way that Christ said it. Luke chapter 9. It's okay if I feel like I'm at home with you guys, right? I'm going to take this coat off. Amen. That's good right there. Luke chapter 9, verse 1. You guys there? Amen. We're going to learn how Jesus told his, taught his disciples how to grow the kingdom. When Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he told them, take nothing for the journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra tonic. Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. If people do not welcome you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave their town as a testimony against them. So they set out and went from village to village, preaching the gospel and healing people everywhere. Amen. That's what Luke said. Now let's go to Mark because Mark adds one thing to this account that we want to learn. Mark chapter 6. He's going to give us the same account, but he's going to add one more thing to it. Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6 verse 7. You have it say amen. amen. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. He called the 12 to himself. This is, we're going to go into the same scripture. He sent them out. This is what he added. How did he send them? It says that he sent them out two by two. When he called the disciples, he called the two brothers, Peter and Andrew. Amen. Then he called the sons of Zebedee. They were two, James and John. And now he's called his disciples together and said, look, I'm going to send you to where I'm going to go. But when he sent them, he sent them out two by two. The first thing that Christ teaches us that if you're going to grow my kingdom, you cannot do it by yourself. Amen. You cannot do it by yourself. Let's go to see why we cannot do it by ourselves. Go over there to Luke chapter, Luke chapter 5. It's going to be a lot of pages flipping tonight, amen? Because when we break this down, we want you to see that we use the scripture throughout the whole thing, amen? Luke chapter 5. Now, when Jesus and Matthew goes and calls his disciples... He gives us an account that he went by the Sea of Galilee and he called the disciples and told them, follow me, and they followed him. Luke, though, gives us a more detailed account as to what happened that day. Amen? Amen. 
Ultimately, it was the same thing, but Luke gave us a little bit more. Amen? Amen. You know, the husband will give you one account, but if you ask the wife, she'll start breaking it down for like 30 minutes. Amen? You have the same story. <laughs> Amen? But women are just a little bit more detailed than men. Praise God. I drive my wife nuts because when she asks me, well, what happened? You know, and I'm like, give her three sentences. Oh, you know where we went, and this is what happened, and this is what ended up being. Praise the Lord. Well, you were there for three hours. That's all that happened. Amen. She can be somewhere for five minutes and give me a 30-minute, you know, <laughs> story of what happened. Well, chapter 5, Luke chapter 5, and let's see Luke's account. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats. Somebody say two boats. Left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets, he got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep waters and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners. They signaled to who? They signaled to their partners. Where did I leave off? In the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. He tells you there, look, I need more than one of you because the kingdom of God is going to grow rapidly and it's going to grow in abundantly. And if it's going to grow the way I said it's going to grow, it requires more than one of you. It requires at least two of you, each one of you using your resources. Brother, I need your help. I got way too many fish in here to take back myself. I need your boat. Amen. Amen. Say it's too many fish for me. I need my brethren, amen? It's too many fish for me, amen? And so the first thing that Christ was teaching them there is that you cannot do it by yourself. I know you want to be the big, bad church, amen? But even the big, bad church can't do it by themselves, amen? I know you want to be a, a multi-million dollar, you know, mega church, but even a multi-million mega church, it can't do it by themselves. You need James and John's boat, amen? It's bigger than you. Say, it's bigger than you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the kingdom of God is bigger than you. It's going to grow bigger than you. Amen? It's going to grow way past what your capacity is. You can't preach enough. Amen? You can't do enough. Your church isn't big enough. Your seats, you don't have enough. Amen? For the way the kingdom of God is going to grow. Amen? That's the first lesson he teaches them. The second lesson, you'll find it over there in Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, verse 10. Yeah. When the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. Then they took with him and they withdrew by themselves to a town called Bethsaida. But the crowds learned about it and followed him. He welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing. Late in the afternoon, the twelve came to him and said, Send the crowd away so that they can go to the surrounding villages and countryside and find food and lodging because we are in a remote place. He replied. What did he reply? Come on, y'all got to say it like you mean it. You give them something to eat. The disciples came to Jesus and said, Jesus, look, these people are hungry. You've been preaching a long time. Amen. You've been preaching mighty long. You've been preaching like a deacon. I'm sorry, brother. I don't know you deacon. Who's that deacon? Sometimes deacons preach long. Amen. And so you've been preaching so long. Amen. They are hungry. They ain't even hungry. They're hungry. You know, they're hungry. They need to go and get some lodging, Jesus. And Jesus turned around and said, this is the opportunity. I'm about to maximize it. I'm going to teach you the second step. He said, you give them something to eat. Who? You. 
you. He was telling the disciples from the beginning, from the beginning of Jesus Christ when he first came, the orders were you give them something. See, the, the high priest is meant to rebuild the sheep gate. But it was the job of the brothers to repair the fish gate. Amen. It is not my job to feed these sheep. It is your job to feed these sheep. Now, you think I'm just telling you that. Go to Luke chapter 2. Keep your finger right where you are in Luke chapter 9. But go on down to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. And verse 8, this is when Jesus Christ was born. And let's see what the angels do. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby. Who were they? Shepherds. shepherds. What kind of animals do you think the shepherds had? Sheep. Sheep. Amen. There were shepherds nearby living, or rather, uh, there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. Wait, wait, let's go. Let's, I'm sorry. Let's, let's, let's start. Wow. Well, um, verse 5. This is Joseph. He went to register with Mary, who was pledged to marry him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to the firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a what? Manger. And placed him in a manger. Somebody say manger. manger. Because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flock at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news and great joy that will be for all of you today, for, for you, for all the people today in the town of David. A Savior has been born. He is the Christ, the Lord. This will be a sign. Say, this will be the sign. Be you will find the baby wrapped in clothes, lying where? In a, in a manger. Let me explain to you what happened before all of this had happened. For 400 years, God had not said an absolute word. From the time of Malachi to the time that Jesus was born, there was no rhema word, no revelation, no prophecy, no prophet, absolutely nothing. Heaven was shut. Amen? God had said absolutely nothing. He sends down, he sends Mary down. He set it up on purpose that Mary would have no room in the inn. And so where she had to deliver her child and place him, she wrapped him up and put him in a manger. Now I want to ask you, does anybody know what a manger is? It's a what? What is it? Sir? A food trot. What's a food trot? Remember, he went to go call the shepherds. Amen. These shepherds had sheep. And the place that the sheep ate from was a little crib, a box. It's called the fodder's box. It's a manger. Amen. The manger is a place where you put the food for the animals to eat. And the place where Jesus was placed at was in the food box because the angels were announcing you had had nothing to eat for a long time and the sheep had had nothing to eat. But today I come to give you good news. There's food in the food box. He's the bread sent down from heaven. There's food for the sheep to eat. Amen. There's food for the sheep to eat. See, we think that the valley, valley of Baca is all oh, just a sad place because I'm crippled. The Valley of Baca, the problem with Baca, for those that you know your Bible real deep, was a place of no pastures. There was nothing to eat. So David went and found himself, Mephibosheth, and brought him out and set him at the king's table. Baby, it's time for you to eat. Amen. And so the place where Jesus was born was the food box. But see, that was the first introduction of Jesus, that he would be food for the sheep. Before Jesus leaves, he had one thing on his mind when he was talking to Peter. He said, Peter, do you love me? And what did Peter say? He said, yes, I love you. And what did Jesus say? Feed my sheep because it is your responsibility to feed the sheep. It's your responsibility to feed the sheep. How am I going to feed them, Lord? Well, Jesus goes back. Let's go back to Luke chapter 9. I'm sorry if I get loud and excited. Y'all seem like people that like to do that. So, you know, if y'all were the quiet ones, I, you know. God is teaching me how to teach. Amen. I used to 
preach about everything. Amen. Praise God. He replied to his disciples when they wanted to send all the sheep away. He said, you give them something to eat. They answered, we only have five loaves of bread and two fish. Unless we go and buy food for all, his, all this crowd. How many loaves? How many fish? Who, who, who was the fish? The brethren were the fish. He called them two by two. He sent them out two by two. He called them two fishermen. Peter and Andrew, James and John, they were two fishermen. Amen. He got two fish. It was on purpose that there was two fish. Amen. Because he called them and sent them out two by two. Amen. Well, for the sake of time, if you read John 6, it tells you who the bread was. Who was the living bread sent down from heaven? It was Jesus Christ. And let's see what he did with the fish and the bread. And it says here, and it says here, he is, um, at, but at verse 14, about 5,000 men were there, but he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. The disciples did so, and everybody sat down, taking the five loaves, the five loaves, and the two fish, and looking up into heaven, he gave thanks and broke them. Then he gave them to the disciples to set before the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the, the people, the disciples picked up 12 baskets of broken pieces that were left over. The second lesson that he was teaching his disciples was not only do you need to go two by two, but it would be the working of the fish and the bread together that would be enough food to feed a lost humanity. It had to be the working of the fish and the bread. Amen? The fish and the bread together was sufficient to multiply. Amen? The fish multiplied when Jesus took the fish and the bread, and then he blessed the union and said, this is what's going to feed the sheep. Yes. Amen? Amen? And there was enough food for everybody. Oh, Lord, but there's only two of us, God. He said, well, two or three are gathered in my name. 